Welcome back to the Foundry's YouTube channel. We're so happy that you decided to connect with us to see what God is doing in and through our church. If you want to stay connected throughout the week, please like us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Without further ado, let's dive into the series I'm so excited about called Believe. So today we get into number five in this series, right? We're jumping into the fifth city that Jesus is talking to, the church in Thyatira. Um, it's, it's this interesting city. We'll talk about that in a minute. But as we go into Thyatira, I need to, you get, well, there's a great, there's a perfect example of what the people in Thyatira, it's a good kind of means of how we're going to communicate this, what they went through. Who here saw the movie Inside Out? Yeah, a few of us did. Great movie. They had um, these different, like it was this little girl, and her parents moved her away, and she had Bing Bong. Anybody love Bing Bong? Oh, so sad when Bing Bong went away. I was like, no, Bing Bong. But it's because he loved her. It was a make-believe friend in her head. And she had these different emotions, right? Anger, fear, sorrow, joy, and disgust. And, and they were, they were kind of, they're not the voices in her head, but it's her emotions kind of talking and guiding her life. It actually, as a movie, was incredibly, I would say, not only intuitive, but impacting as a psychological movie. I don't know if it's a psychological thriller, but it's a psychological movie, and it kind of, you walk out going, I wonder what my little voices are. Well, at our family dinner table, after we had seen this movie a couple times, we started playing that game. Who would you be? Who's your, you know, your anger, fear, your disgust? And so um, pull this up real quick. These are mine. You may not know this, but um, I'm not a fearful person. I, you know, I'll do a lot of stupid things and sometimes just for free. But um, Marlon is me because when it comes to my kids, I, I am Marlin. I'm like, careful by the road. It's okay. I'm just weird, and I'm very frightened. Then Tigger, I like to bounce all over people. It's fun. I, there's piglets in my life. I'm like, hey, buddy. You know, I like jump on them. I, I'm a little bit like Tigger. I would say my disgust is Dame Judy Dench. If, if I am disgusted with you, you can feel it. It is a shocking thing, and if you don't know Jane, Dame Judy Dench, you need to watch Pride and Prejudice when Lady Catherine yells at young Elizabeth and heaven and earth have the shades of Pemberley come to thus. It's a great moment in all cinema and Jane Austen's writing. Then Sadness by the ever-beautiful Ariel. I mean, first of all, for a cartoon, well done, Disney. Uh, she, she and I are the same age. She was 16 when I was 16, so it's perfectly a normal attraction. And then, um, and then Braveheart. When I finally lose it and something snaps, I paint myself blue and I just go to war. I just, there's something crazy. I remember one time an elder at a former church, of course, said to me, there's something crazy in your eyes in that argument. And I'm like, yeah, I can feel that. So that is really a good snapshot of who I am and who I think would play the different emotions inside of my head. And here's the thing. In all honesty, I think if any one of us in this room had to have that movie made inside our heads about us, we would be deeply uncomfortable, wouldn't we? How would you like your emotions, your motives, your thoughts, your dreams, your anger, your despair, your disgust to be seen unfiltered by the whole world. Like there is a part of us that wants to be known. It might be the single most tender and wonderful aspect of the gospel that we're known by Jesus Christ, that we're loved by Jesus Christ. There is something in us that wants to be known by friends and by family it's important to our emotional health to be known. But there's also those barriers where we're like, yeah, but not all of it, you know? We don't want everybody to see how broken we really are. But being known is a big deal. And so is being left out. When you're left out of something, it hurts. So let's start on the outside tonight. 
Let's look at some of the ways the church in Thyatira had to face what it was like to suddenly be on the outside of a society that they were deeply rooted in, in relationship, in tradition, and in praxis. They were very close as a community because in Thyatira, they had these things called guilds. And you're like, what? They could breathe underwater? No, not guilds. There's a D in there, G-U-I-L-D-S, guilds. There was a textile guild. The biggest guild in uh, Thyatira was the bronze working guild. And here Here's how it works. If you're in the textile guild, what would happen is you would work in this, in this grouping of families in a community. If anybody's ever been to a little Italy in like Manhattan and Boston, those are the two best little Italys outside of Italy that I've ever been to, which that's the big Italy. But um, those two are uniquely kind of closed communities, and they're little Italy, Right? These guilds would have been the textile guild, and you would have been brought up in the trades. You would have gone to the different um, celebrations and ritual feasts. You would have traveled together. It was your people. It was your community. When, um, when you were leaving like out of adolescence, you would kind of come up being the runabout for the textile workers. Then you become an apprentice. Then you become a journeyman. And then you become the master textile worker. And it was a community that depended on one another. They leaned in when times are hard. They were very close. And Thyatira was known for its very many guilds. So when they became Christians, they wouldn't go do things like the ritual feasts. Well, if you're not going to go to the ritual feast, you might tick God off in the Greek pantheon. And so we can't have you doing that. So what would happen? They would push them out of the guild. They would find themselves on the outside of life. They would say goodbye to social and financial benefits of who they were. They would lose identity. They would become very lonely. And God wasn't ignorant or blind of their heartache in this season. He was not ignorant or blind of the heartache they felt in the choice to be literally removed from a community they loved. It's the only thing they ever knew, and it's all they ever really wanted to know until they met one who was so compelling they would follow Jesus anywhere, even if it meant isolation. Revelation 2, 18 and 19, to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. Do you see what's happening here? Do you see the language? into the largest guild in Thyatira. They know what blazing fire is. They know what bronze, burnished bronze look like, not, not decoratively. They know it by trade, whose eyes like blazing fire and burnished bronze. He says, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. If we think back to the church of Ephesus who left their first love and God said no, we can look at this and be like, oh, wow. They're doing more than they did at first. God had seen them step out and step up in their faith time and again. They were growing. They were transforming. They were, they were working towards that beautiful divine compliment while well done, good and faithful servant. They were living into it. You're doing more than, than you did at first, and it's remarkable considering that most of them had lost everything they knew to be their reality, their society, their culture, their, their families. They were on the outside, yes. But in Christ, they were able to do more than they did before. Unfortunately, Jesus isn't done speaking to the church in Thyatira. Jesus has something else to say to them because they had a few bad situations going on. And Jesus would confront them with crystal clarity and words that cut to the heart. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent, but she will not. So I will cast her onto a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her to suffer intensely until they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and the minds, and I will repay you according to your deeds. Oh, 
I mean, talk about catching a fastball high and inside, right? That'll brush you back off the plate a little bit and go, whoa. But when you read that, that's the words of Jesus. So what we need to do in this is take a minute and look historically at Jezebel. Right Last week we talked about Balaam, who is way back in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. So there's the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi, and that is the Hebrew Bible. And then there is the New Testament, the fulfillment of the Old Testament in Jesus Christ, uh, Matthew through Revelation. In the Old Testament, in the very first book of the Bible, we find ourselves um, like not in the first book of the Bible, in the book of Chronicles and Kings, we find ourselves meeting Queen Jezebel. She is one of the queens married to King Ahab of the northern tribe of Israel. And she is the worst, most despotic, evil woman in the history of the monarchy. She willfully and brazenly led people away from God. She did her best to lead them away from God. She got them to participate in idol worship that was so depraved and so dark and so evil, they not only committed every form of immorality and, and brokenness known in, from heaven and earth, they, they sacrificed their children to Molech. She was a horrible, horrible woman who brazenly led people away from God. And when God would send prophets to speak out, she put them to death. She's a horrible example of godless, brazen hatred of God. And Jesus is naming the spirit of Jezebel. She's not resurrected in this. This is the spirit of Jezebel. And what does the spirit of Jezebel do? Leads astray the people of God, not just a little, brazenly, boldly, in your face, leading them astray. And this would have been understood by the church in Thyatira, the people who were operating under the spirit of Jezebel would have been the Gnostics. And this is really important. Gnostics would go out into the, to the wilderness, they'd like live in a cave for sometimes years, and they would come back with special revelation. Deep secrets of God. And they were teaching in the church of Thyatira, they were teaching about the deep secrets of Satan. And it was absolute destructive garbage and nonsense. But this is what they were teaching. What you have to do is you have to go as deeply into sin as possible. Go and experience every sinful thing you can so that you know how to combat it. Like, do anybody else want to be like, that seems like a bad idea, Gnostic? No, just me? I'm like, what is that? But that's the truth. They came back and said, these are the deep secrets. You got to get into sin. You've got to fully experience every possible kind of sin to know how to combat it and to then fully appreciate the grace you've been given. It's a lie from the pit of hell. And it reminds me, of a conversation between a serpent and a woman in Genesis chapter 3. The serpent approaches the woman and said, did God really say you can eat of no tree in this garden? And the woman said, no, ye said we could eat of all the trees. We just can't eat of that one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And this is what the serpent said. Oh, uh, I think her words were, we can't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil because the day we do, we shall surely die. And the serpent replies, you will not surely die. God doesn't want you to eat of the tree of knowledge and good and evil because the day that you eat of it, you will know the deep secrets of sin and good just like God. Isn't it interesting how evil never changes its playbook? We get into some secret special revelation and it leads the people away. It leads them away. The spirit behind this is rebellion pulling people away from Christ. It was the motive of the serpent of Satan himself. Satan's desire is to pull as many of the people as he can into hell with him and remove from God those whom he loves and those who bear his image. It has never been different since the first sin till now to pull them away and deceive them and misinterpret the words of God. And that's what was going on in this city. It is really, I think, a polar opposite of this would be James 4, 7, where it says, so James is an epistle, uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's the half-brother of Jesus. He was the leader of the church in Jerusalem, and James wrote the book 
called James later in the New Testament. And in 4 7, it says this Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Jezebel says, indulge in everything, get all you can, experience it all, then at least you'll be wise to know what your temptations are. And he says, no, no, submit to God, submit to him, give, trust that he knows better, don't give in to the craven base desires of who you are, who I am, don't give in to that, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. That's the truth. That's the truth. And when I look at this, I I think for me, I understand more and more of how hard the the option is. Indulge in what you want or have the discipline to submit. Because you and I both know it's not easy to do. It's not easy to submit ourselves. But we're called to it in Scripture because God has shown us through the serpent, through Jezebel, that there are those who desire to pull us and plunge us into eternal separation from God. And he will deceive us with things that tickle our ears and mortally wound our souls. We have to be cautious, and we have to know this. Jezebel will be held to account because the wages of sin is death. That's what James says. If you sin, the payment for a good work day of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. It is not enlightenment. And that's what Jezebel was saying. If you participate in this, you'll be enlightened. You'll understand more fully. So this church in Thyatira had to understand. They had to let things go, the wrong things go. They had to let them go. Two weeks in a row, Jesus is speaking into churches, saying there's things going on in your community that must be dealt with and cannot be tolerated. This church was tolerating evil. It's spoken of twice in back-to-back scriptures to -to back-to-back churches. We need to listen to this and understand that last week we talked about evil that sneaks kind of in the back door, a sneaky kind of small things. But this is the braven plunge right kicking down the front door and invading your life. We have to recognize that Jesus says this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And the church in Thyatira was doing a good job, keeping watch of themselves, but they were allowing certain things to sneak in around them. There were things going on in the church that they were tolerating and not confronting, even though it was brazenly coming at them. They were tolerating it. So what about us? What about you and I? Let's just have a really tough conversation for a few minutes. I'm going to use this. Okay, my phone. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I'm going to ask you a question. Parents, who of you in here would take your kid down to the Sunset Strip in Hollywood and drop them off every night at 10 and say, see you at 6 a.m. when I wake you for school? Anybody? Anybody? Anybody willing to take their kid to the strip in Vegas, drop them off on the strip and say at 10 p.m., hey, see you in the morning? You're like, no, the gates of hell. I mean, that's what you're doing. But I will tell you this, parents, with your kids and your phones, and their phones going into their rooms unmonitored, this is literally the portal to hell itself. There is more pornography, abuse, and vile, horrible things going on on these phones. And we're like this, our kids are good, and we told them not to use it after they close and lock their door. So let's just be real honest. you got to be willing to tick them off, not because you want to, but because you're not willing to put them at the gates of hell and cross your fingers and hope for the best. That is an abdication of your responsibility. Our kids are dying Because we don't want to be that parent. Be that parent. I'll be honest. I am that parent. I am super unpopular, and I am fine with it. I've told them I'm willing to have you hate me to know that I love you. It's fine. I don't like it. I'll live with it. And my kids, they don't. And I think my oldest son, don't tell him, but I think the dude can take me. But I'm like, no, give me your phone. He's like, all right, Pop. He knows. It's not easy. But we need to quit um, 
kind of abdicating our responsibility and being like, well, it's okay. It's not going on in my house. Yes, it is. The number one thing Zealand East High School said to us when we did an introductory thing there was uh, for when our son Josh was going in as a freshman and then Isabella, when they came in, they said, please don't leave your kids in their rooms at night with their devices. They're coming to school exhausted. There's no time where they're not attached to their phones. They're checking it all night long. They're seeing what they're missing. We are miserably addicted to this. And I will say it again. You are letting them sit at the gate of hell and it's going on in your home. It needs to stop. We need to parent our kids in costly ways to us. Yes, they may be more unpopular. I survived it. You know, if I'm honest, I made it through being unpopular. I'll tell you this, it is eating our culture alive. What about this? What about if we had a friend and we see this friend growing uh, an affection for someone else and that person isn't involved in their marriage, right? They're getting an affection for someone beyond their marriage. That's a hard conversation to have. That is a hard conversation to have. But I will tell you this, church, if you look out and you see one of your buddies And he's kind of cozying up with somebody and something's going on. And you're like, oh, I don't want to make him uncomfortable. He's a good guy. No, he's not. Say something. Don't give yourself an out. Don't tolerate evil. I have friends in this church who have walked different roads on this. I went to a friend and I said, look, man, I like you a lot. And he is a friend. We've known each other a while. And I said, I like you a lot, but there's something going on I'm not comfortable with that I'm seeing. I named it. He didn't turn red, but he didn't stay white, right? He just kind of, it just didn't sit real well. It wasn't real good. But I will tell you this. His marriage is phenomenal right now. He is living in covenant with his wife because of an uncomfortable conversation that I did not want to have. I didn't want to have, but I couldn't sit there and be like, oh, I'm hoping for the best. Quit hoping for the best. Speak into it. Resist the devil. He flees. I literally watched it happen in the life of my friend. And I'm so thankful God gave me the courage because I didn't have it when I started that conversation. I think I hemmed and hawed a lot because I was scared. It's hard, but we have to resist. In our business dealings, We will walk all over people to get a little more for us. Greed is an issue in our culture. Are we going to name it or are we just going to keep collecting things to keep in a storage unit? Church, we have to have conversations about these kinds of things and quit apologizing for hard conversations and start repenting for tolerating sin that breaks the heart of God. Jesus didn't die to forgive most of your sins. He wants all of you. And we are called to live in that tension. The next verse. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. God understands what's going on on the inside. Jesus is saying, I search your hearts and your minds, and it's really wild. This is a warning and a comfort It is a warning because we know this. Jesus said at the end, all the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and the mind and I will repay you for your deeds. God knows what Jezebel's up to, the spirit of Jezebel. God knows that the Nicolaitans are justifying and tolerating sin. God knows about it and he will deal with them. I think his exact words were, I will throw her on a bed of suffering and I will put anyone who commits adultery with her on that bed and they will suffer immensely. God knows, he will deal with it. There's a warning. If you think you're getting away with things in the quiet of your own life, you are not. God won't have it. He knows what's going on and he will judge it. Because God made the same promise to King David. We heard it all summer long in our Kings series. We heard it all summer long in a voice that's far better than mine. As for you, David said to my son, his son Solomon, know the, Lord, the God of your father and serve him with your whole heart and a willing mind. The Lord searches all hearts. He understands every intent and thought. If you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. Ha, oh, church, we got to be warned that we cannot tolerate or play games with evil. 
We can't let little things get in. We can't dive deeply into sin and pretend it's no big deal. It's a very big deal. But for those of us who have stood firm, for those of you who are fighting the war week in and week out, and you don't work in a safe place in a church like I do, and you work around people who are as pagan as the people in Thyatira and Pergamum, for you who go and you go about this, and you know that you have stood firm, and you've worked to guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus and your homes, know this, he understands. It's a comfort to those of us who have lived faithfully. The thing that is a warning, a dire warning to people is also a comfort to us is a, it's a comfort to hear. I am he who searches the hearts and the minds of people. That is a comfort for you and I. We're not perfect, but we know we're redeemed in Christ Jesus and we are being transformed into his image, not requiring him to be made into ours. That is an important reality for us to grab onto because God understands what's going on on the inside, but also on the outside. Listen to what he says in Revelation 2, 24 and 25. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, I love this because it shows the kindness of God. Remember, weak, lonely, beleaguered people, you know that you didn't hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. I will not impose any other burden on you except this. Hold on until, to what you have until I come. Jesus knows. They gave up status. They gave up jobs, friendships. They gave up being relevant in the society they loved and knew. He knows they have worked hard not to participate in false doctrines and in a life apart from that. He knows that they resisted Jezebel even though she was influential. And so he says, look, I'm not going to put any more burdens on you. Just hold on to what you have. Hold your ground and fight for it. Makes me think of what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10.5. Because we have to bring every thought captive to Christ. We have to rule this. We have to look at it and understand that we are called to rule over something. But before we get there, we recognize Jesus Christ was first aware of the struggle we have. He knows how lonely and frustrating and tiring it gets. But we have to remember, you are not alone. You, the temple of the Holy Spirit, have a fellowship with Almighty God that strengthens you not only unto life eternal, but it strengthens you into purposeful living right here and right now for the glory of Jesus Christ. So let's take a look what it means to rule on the inside. Because Jesus gives a charge. He gives a charge to his church. He won't hold on. He won't give you anything more, but hold on. Think of a skier holding a ski rope. Hold on. With all that you have, hold on to it. Hold on comes from the Greek word kreto, right? Kreto, it means this, to rule over strongly. I like that word. Rule over it. We must rule over our bodies and our minds, You may think like, okay, how? How do I rule over my body and mind? That's what Jesus is saying. Take charge and rule over your mind. You may think, how? The Apostle Paul says it this way. Demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And take captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. Make it obedient to Jesus Christ. I don't know about you. I've never taken captives except when I was little. And a few of them I drug off to a fort. No, you're our captives. And you just drag them off, right? Taking captive is not a passive thing. You take captive every thought and you make it obedient to Christ. It says there is no excuse for folding up and being like, well, I just couldn't get out of it. No, that is not how it goes. If we rule inside, we take captive Every thought that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and say, no, you are going to be obedient to Christ. And when we rule on the inside, we begin to rule on the outside. When we are faithful with the task of ruling by the power of Christ, our thoughts will literally begin to be refined. You'll find yourself not dwelling on the things that caused you to stumble time and time again when you physically take captive your thoughts and make them obedient to Christ. Thyatira had to rule inwardly in their inmost self, but they didn't do so without a promise. Jesus promised them if they succeeded, check out this last chunk of scripture given to this church. 
to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end. I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I've received authority from my Father, I will also give that one the morning star. Oh, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Rule inside, and I promise you, you will rule with me. The promise of Jesus is this, that we have to do a work in participation with him. You're not earning your salvation. You're just fighting to be a living witness for Jesus Christ. My friends, I invite you, make no justifications in the life you live for sin. Make no space in your life to say, I don't think that's a big deal to God. I think it is because Jesus died for that. Have the hard conversations. Rule in your hearts and your minds. Make your inner self obedient to Christ. And trust that the, the place he's put you is not only purposeful, but it's for the redemption of more than just you. So that you may be a living witness to the world around you. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the word that comes from your scriptures and the way we can be challenged to live in it. And God, as we look at this church, may we recognize and remember that we who are so weak lie if we believe it. We are not weak. We are filled with the Spirit of God, the Spirit that hovered over the waters and is the very voice of God speaking in our lives. Lord, we are not weak. We are just unwilling. So I pray that you would give us a willing spirit to participate with you in the glorious redemption of your creation and that we would actively fight against any spirit that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Anything of a Jezebel in our lives that seeks to allow or indulge a sin. Lord, I pray that you would convict us, call us to repentance and transform us, that we would be a living witness And one day we could experience what it is to rule and reign with you in authority in our own lives and in the world around us that we would bring the scepter of the gospel and culture would bend the knee to the glory of Jesus Christ in whose name we pray, amen. Thanks for tuning in to watch this week's message. If you're looking for a way to prepare for next week, click the link below in the description box. There's where you'll find devotions. Now, devotions are a crucial part of the Foundry's weekly rhythm. I hope this message has been encouraging, but also challenging for you. And we'd love to see you again next week.